Well, I don't have to tell all of you that other changes have taken place, including the broadening of the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders from a very narrow diagnosis to one that is so broad that the term autism now includes everyone from you know, somebody who's, who's profoundly um, intellectually disabled uh, to somebody without a diagnosis uh, who, you know, who might be uh, a, a brilliant but socially uh, awkward and quirky physics professor. There are newer phenotypes, meaning that people have a diagnosis of autism that never would have had one before. I mean, back in Leo Connor's day, who first described autism in 1943 uh, as a distinct syndrome, if a child had seizures, they weren't given a diagnosis of autism. And yet we know how common seizures are in autism. If a child had any level of cognitive disability, mentally re mental retardation, that child was not given a diagnosis of autism. In fact, someone with, was only given a diagnosis with autism through most of the 20th century if autism was shown to be idiopathic, if the cause was not known. But if there was Down syndrome, child had Down syndrome but also had autism, there'd be no autism diagnosis. And so when I've interviewed elderly people who have autism, uh, their parents or they tell me their first diagnoses and they were, you know, a mishmash of, of, of different types of words. Obsessive compulsive disorder with seizures and emotional block was one that was very common for people who were very quiet. And so what we're seeing now is a very different landscape where autism is being used as a concept that is so broad that we are now seeing autism used by people who, who don't appear to us on the surface to be particularly disabled, but yet they describe that disability to us. And the woman pictured here, uh, Heather, she was on an American television show that probably aired here too called America's Next Top Model. And uh, she made it to the finals, and she was a very poised and uh, bright woman who described herself as someone with autism. Indeed, uh, she had been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, and she spoke about her autism openly a couple of years ago, and it was a big shock to people that somebody would come out on national television and say, hello, I have autism. I was just listening to the taxi the other day in London, and there was a, there was a cricketer with, uh, with depression, who's open and talking about his depression. This is the new kind of openness that is leading us to think that there's more mental illness than ever before, when in fact it is a sign of the decrease in stigma, an increase in recognition, and therefore also an increase in treatment. Don't underestimate awareness when you think about concepts of prevalence and epidemic, awareness is something that you can't quantify. You're not going to find a study that can tell you how much awareness is causing our increase in diagnoses of autism. But awareness is at the heart of changes across cultures, across time, in changes in the conception of how common a disorder is. We now know that the diagnostic net has widened considerably. People are being diagnosed with autism earlier because of awareness, and they're being diagnosed later because of awareness. In the state of Minnesota, a single cohort of children was followed for many years. These are the same kids. The rate of autism in those children was 13 in 10,000 at the age of 6. It was 21 in 10,000 at the age of, of 9, and 33 in 10,000 at the age of 11. These are the same kids. These aren't different birth cohorts. We know that autism is pretty much in full bloom and presentation by the age of 3. Is it possible that these kids suddenly got autism at age 6? That they suddenly got autism at age 9 or 11? I don't think so. What happened was that the educational environment changed. New programs were put in place. And when you've got new programs put in place, you need to fill those programs with people. And you find people that you can educate and help. And I'm not saying that these kids didn't have autism. But what I am saying is that if you look at the growth in prevalence in a particular cohort in the Minnesota public school system, you'd think it's an epidemic. In fact, it's kids finally getting the services they need. 
We know that the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act had dramatic increases in children who had a classification of autism after, after the 1991-92 school year. Uh, there were actually two diagnoses that were introduced during the 1991-92 school year in the Department of Education statistics in the U.S. Uh, one is autism and the other is a traumatic brain disorder. And uh, what you saw with traumatic brain disorder, oh, same thing. But there is nobody, to my knowledge, in the United States talking about an epidemic of traumatic brain injury. We see this every day. Maybe, I don't know how much you see it in uh, the UK, but I would imagine that you see this trucks and envelopes all the time, right? Uh, it's ubiquitous. What we don't often see is this nice shaded area that I've colored yellow. It's a arrow that I'm sure the advertising executives who created the logo were quite aware of, uh, but we don't notice it. It's a negative space within the slogan. Uh, in the logo, and we just don't see it. But, you know, if you go back now to the uh, FedEx logo, your eye goes like a laser beam to it. <laughs> and you will never look at this the same way. <laughs> and I guarantee you that tomorrow you'll see a truck, you'll see an envelope, it'll go right to it, and you'll say, curse that grinker, I can't... <laughs> I can't not see that thing anymore. Um, but you know, the, the bottom line is that that arrow was there all along. We weren't primed to see it. You now are, and you will see it, and you'll see it more and more and more. And so I hope that in the coming days, and in the week, and two weeks, when you see this logo, you say, you know, you see it now everywhere. I see this arrow everywhere, and I didn't know it was there before. But it's not because it wasn't there before. We know that methods, how a study is done, will make a big difference in the kinds of numbers that get generated. And this is not just a function of whether or not somebody's well-trained or not. People use different methods because of the different social and cultural contexts in which they are working. When we're working in Korea, so I have a project in Korea, we can't use records because the records don't tell us anything. People don't use the term autism very much. We just can't do it. The records are not going to provide us with enough data to suggest anything except that autism is extremely rare and probably doesn't even exist in South Korea. And we know that's not true. I've been doing work with the Korean community in Flushing, in Queens. There are 400,000 uh, Koreans in the uh, New York City area, greater New York City metropolitan area. And it looks like there's very little autism because there's nobody getting services. At least we can't find any much record of it in the, in, in the uh, uh, disability uh, uh, records and the clinic records because there's so much discomfort and stigma attached to it. People aren't going to report it. And even if they're reporting a child who has a problem that might be consistent with autism, they will report it in a way that's non-stigmatizing and say, uh, you know, my child focuses so well. Now, this is a child who's not making eye contact and is focusing only on one thing and it, to, to the level of impairing his social and communication abilities it, and basically um, blocking out the rest of the world, but it will be phrased positively. So you find only the more, most severely impaired kids are getting diagnosed. We know sample size makes a big difference. Uh, big studies come up with usually uh, lower rates than small studies where you can actually focus and look at everybody rather than just use records. We know that certain instruments work better than others to catch more cases and capture more cases. That's uh, uh, the sensitivity of the, the cutting off score, uh, of the cutoff scores for uh, screening measurements will make a big difference as well. But nothing, I think, makes as big a difference as access to services. And in this slide, you have two squares. Uh, in, and they both contain the same number of white 
or black dots. They both contain the same number of dots, 80 dots. In the box on the left, you have a population that doesn't have many services. Let's call it Alabama. It's a state in the United States that's big, people are spread out, and it's a poor state. There are very few resources or services for autism, very few autism-related schools or um, community resources for kids with autism. And so if you're looking in the service sector for your data, which is what most epidemiologists do, they're looking in that pink area, they find a small prevalence. And it, they're led to think that autism is not very common in that state. Now let's call the box on the right New Jersey, a densely populated small state in which there are a lot of services. And you're looking in the service sector again for your data and you find them and all of a sudden it looks like there's higher prevalence and in fact that's what is found with the lowest prevalence in the United States according to the Centers for Disease Control in Alabama and the highest prevalence in New Jersey. And it is not that people from Alabama are moving to New Jersey for the autism services. It is that the data are coming from the records. You cannot count a case unless you see it. That's the bottom line. You cannot count a case until you see it. And we don't even know how many kids we can't see in the United States because of structural barriers like lack of insurance and poverty and access to clinics. And we don't know how many people we can't see in the United States because even when they do have insurance, ethnic or other influences might be preventing them from accessing services. In the Kaiser system in Northern California, it's become clear that the, uh, that the kids with good insurance who are autistic, who are Latino, are not following up on referrals and not getting evaluated and therefore not getting diagnosed or if they are being diagnosed much later than others. So I mean this is the, the we don't even know fully what's happening in our own society yet culturally to be able to then just move confidently out into sub-Saharan Africa and try to figure out what's going on there. 